What I'm going to do now is talk about one of these special families that we worked on in the States called the Iowa Kindred. The family tree is shown here and you can see in the dark blue that there are many people over one, two, three, four generations who have got Parkinson's. Uh, a couple of things about the family. The first is the family was brought to us by this man uh, here. Uh, and this, this man lived to be 90. He did not have Parkinson's disease, but his two uh, brothers had Parkinson's disease and they died in their 30s. It's a very early onset disease. And he traced the family back to this person in 1840 uh, in Iowa, hence the name the Iowa Kindred. And then he traced down this side of the family and traced these distant relatives in California. So in fact, it was this family member who put this whole family together. And as I say, the age of onset in this family is about 35 years old, and it's inherited in a form we call autosomal dominum. <coughs> and what our job was as geneticists was to find out what genes all the affected members in this family shared and all the unaffected members did not share. And we were able to do that because of the work this, this family member had done in genealogy. I'll just say a couple of other things about the family. Um, the, first, the, the first is that before 1967 or 68, before there was L-DOPA or dopamine agonist therapy, people survived with the disease about five or six years. Nowadays, after L-DOPA and dopamine agonist therapy, people in this family uh, survive over 20 years with the disease. So actually, it's really impressive, although you know, I agree with what Hugh said, we wish we had made more progress. In fact, L-DOPA and, and dopamine therapy has had a huge effect, which you can see dramatically historically in this family, uh, really, really uh, dramatically. The other, uh, um, so we found the gene, I'll talk about the gene in a second. I'll just say some of the other work that we found the gene in this family in the late 1990s. Uh, two years ago, one of my other colleagues and I, uh, Henry Holden, uh, went back to visit the family, and we went back to visit the family to take skin cells uh, from the family members because uh, another breakthrough that we've had in research that we and other groups are using is to take skin cells and to turn those skin cells well firstly you regress them to fetal cells by giving them uh, special growth factors which kind of knock them back to being like fetal cells and then we allow them to develop to dopamine neurons and so we've now got dopamine neurons which have the mutation which causes dopamine neurons to die. We have got that in the lab uh, and we are working on that and this family and other families the same way and these, the cells we take from these and similar families are now in cell banks and are available for everybody to use. Um, we and other groups are using cells from this family and many of the other families we've worked on to try and work out the d disease. The other point I'll make now with regard to this family is that one of the, the issues that actually was dealt with in the talk you had last year from Alistair Noyce is that we, we want to get better at diagnosing the disease earlier. In fact, pre-symptomatically. And these special families allow us to, to know who is going to get sick before they get sick. At the moment, we can study them uh, to try and work out what, is, what the changes are before they go and see a neurologist. And there's a lot of work on that in this type of family, looking at smell testing, looking at constipation, looking at sleep abnormalities, all things that we think afflict people with Parkinson's disease sometimes before they get sick. 
we're trying to put those into a natural history of the disease, a complete natural history going back before, if you like, you go and see your neurologist for a movement disorder. And we are, we are using this type of family to do that type of study, of course, with the eventual intention that when we develop treatments, we can test treatments in these families, treatments which we hope will slow and stop the disease before the disease starts. So this type of family is giving us insights in two different ways. It's telling us the processes which underlie the disease and also the families are a great test bed and of course they welcome this for testing therapies which are designed to inhibit those processes. And I should say that at uh, UCL we've got a special facility called the Wolfson facility which allows us to do these type of studies on patients, well they're not patients because they're not yet sick, but on individuals who are mutation carriers. So this is how we're using, we, this is how we use this type of approach to understand the disease. Anyway, to come back to the finding in this family, we look through this family to try and find what the gene was, what part of the genome all the people in dark blue had inherited and none of those in light blue had inherited. And what we found and it, uh, is a mutation in the synuclein gene. As Hugh said, you've got two chromosomes, one from your mum and one from your dad. And what you're looking at here is the nucleus of a cell from somebody in this family. And you can see that where the synuclein probe has lit up. It's lit up the normal chromosome here with a single dot, just one dot here, but this is the chromosome with the mutation, and actually there are three dots in a row here. And what is happening, in what causes the disease in this family is that instead of having, like most of us, two copies of the synuclein gene, they've got four copies of the synuclein gene. So they make a normal protein, but they make twice as much of that normal protein as they should. And, so, and that is enough to give, them, uh, to give them the disease. And that's very interesting and important because when we look at the pathology of Parkinson's disease in most other families, we see synuclein in the brain cells deposited and what you're looking at here is a, a Lewy body this is what we see in Parkinson's disease and it's made of the synuclein protein so we know now that the reason that these people deposit this protein in their brain and get sick is extremely simple they simply make twice as much of the protein as they should. And that is an enormous clue uh, as to uh, how we might develop treatments. So that, that's really been a big uh, breakthrough. Now I've been talking so far about very special families. We only know half a dozen families like the family I've just shown you throughout the world. What about Parkinson's disease in general? I've told you that these people in the Iowa kindred get Parkinson's disease because they make twice as much synuclein as they should. What about in the, in the general population? Well, we have been looking, we and other groups, have been looking at the synuclein gene in the general population. And what we find is that there is normal genetic variability. So all of us in this room will make subtly different uh, amounts of synuclein. And what we are finding is that the people with Parkinson's disease on the right have a variant which in general, it's not a one-for-one -one relationship, but in general, more of them make more synuclein. So if you make much too much synuclein, you're going to get Parkinson's disease for definite. If you, if, because of this normal variability, if, if you make a little bit more than average, 
uh, then you are more likely to get uh, Parkinson's disease. So the finding we made in the, in the Iowa kindred is an extreme example of what's true in the general population. In the general population, those of us who make more synuclein are more likely to get Parkinson's disease than those of us who make less. It's a, it's a, it's a correlation. So it really helps us to, to understand the biology of the disease in general. And I've given you the example of synuclein, but actually we're looking across the genome in this type of way to try and find other genes whose expression is different between Parkinson's disease and controls. Now actually, we in the, the whole field have actually now found 10 genes which in different ways cause Parkinson's. It's been a remarkable time. The first finding was made by a colleague of mine called Bob Nussbaum in 1996. And since then, we have found 14 genes, 14 different genes which cause Parkinson's disease. Now we've got a lot of genes which cause Parkinson's disease. There are, there's one important question. Do these genes have anything in common? Is, are they pointing in the same direction? Are they pointing at particular biological processes? Do they have something in common? Do they have a function in common? And the answer to that is absolutely, definitely yes. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. In the, you can see, it is the, there's the list of the genes. Three of the genes are in bold and in italics. And I've put those in bold and italics because these are actually reason, there's reasonably, the mutations in these genes are reasonably common uh, in the U United Kingdom. Uh, and because they're reasonably common, we as a, we, and again I'm talking about the Parkinson community in general, are collecting families with mutations in these genes so that we can start to to run trials solely in different types of Parkinson's disease. So we can run a trial in people with Parkin mutations, or we can run a trial in people with LERC2 mutations, or we can run a trial with people in GBA mutations, because it might be that the, the subtle differences uh, in the causing of the disease in these groups that we can then, we can then you know, use to devise smarter clinical trials. So these in italics and bold, we're using in this way to try and put together uh, trial-ready cohorts. And Hugh is going to talk about uh, uh, using, uh, doing uh, clinical trials. Now this slide is technical and I, I don't intend to kind of go into the details, but the, the, this slide shows the two cellular processes we are reasonably sure all the Parkinson genes have in common. And actually the two processes are actually related to each other. Uh, the top line here is called uh, autophagy. And this is the process by which cells degrade unwanted uh, material within them. So it's a process, an internal cellular processes process for removing debris from inside the cell and unwanted proteins. And that process, all, many of the genes involved in Parkinson's disease are involved in that process. And the second process is the process of removing damaged mitochondria from cells. Specifically, it's called mitophagy. And actually, we have a group, and there's a very good group. Actually, they were in Sheffield, but they've just moved to Cambridge, uh, working on, on this process, a defect in removing damaged mitochondria in cells. Why should that cause Parkinson's disease? We don't know, though we have some clues, and there's pr work now going on to try and understand that. So the genetics is giving us real biochemical clues as to what, what causes the disease and what processes we should um, 
intervening. This is a picture, of course, of Muhammad Ali, who's got what seems to be Parkinson's disease. And this is a headline uh, from The Observer uh, quite recently, uh, in April this year. Are we going to use these genetic findings to try and use gene-based therapies? And the answer, in part, is yes, we are, as a, as a community, we are doing that. I showed you that if you make too much synuclein, uh, you, you, get, you get Parkinson's disease. The synuclein builds up in your brain and you get Parkinson's disease. Now, based upon similar work in Alzheimer's disease, there is now a very active process of vaccinating, uh, of testing a vaccine against synuclein as one method of clearing synuclein uh, from the brain. So we are using therapeutic approaches. This is just one example. We are using therapeutic approaches which are directly based upon the genetic findings and others are in process which are indirectly based upon the genetic findings to try and uh, understand the disease so we get to better treatments. <laughs> Parkinson was inherited. Uh, unfortunately, as with most things in science, there isn't a simple answer. But the bottom line is that for most people, no. The gentleman in the picture, one is affected by Parkinson's, one isn't, they're brothers. The question is what's different between them that has meant that one person's gone to develop Parkinson's and the other hasn't. If we understood that, then that would really take us forward.